Welcome, everybody. Please sit down. Welcome to Viacom. I am uh, Philippe Domon, the President and CEO of Viacom, and more importantly, the co chair of the partnership for New York City. And on behalf of the partnership, we are delighted to join New York Magazine in celebrating the new New York. And uh, more specifically, the juncture of the financial sector and technology in New York. New York, where I've lived all my life, has uh, always had the energy of innovation and change. And that's what makes it exciting. And if you look at the financial services industry, it's been the leading industry in New York my entire life. It accounts today for about 20% of the economic output of New York at about a third of the private sector payroll. Now, technology is now the fastest growing industry in New York. It started out in Silicon Alley, focused on e-commerce, media, but now it really touches on every sector of our economy. So we have more and more companies being formed here, some of them represented on the panel. And uh, the intersection with healthcare, retail, education continues to grow and grow. So now about New York Magazine. New York Magazine, hosting us today, is, tells the story of New York, not just here, but around the world. It has 2.4 million readers a month across print and other platforms and includes, let me get this right, NewYorkMag.com, Vulture, The Cut, and Grub Street, which together attract an audience every month of 23 million people. So tonight we're here to discuss the dynamics of technology working with the financial services sector. We have a very distinguished panel, which I will now introduce, fellow partnership members from both sectors. We have starting, I'll choose the moderator last, Chad Dickerson, the chief executive officer of Etsy Inc., which went public earlier this year, right, Chad? Gary Cohn, the president and chief operating officer of Goldman Sachs. John Oranger, the founder and CEO of Shutterstock, Inc. Kevin Ryan, chairman and founder of Gilt, Business Insider, MongoDB, and Zola. Is that it? Hey, Contour. One more. OK. Thank you. One more. I missed one. Bob Greifeld, CEO of the NASDAQ OMX Group, Inc., on which we are listed. And finally, our moderator, Annie Lowry, contributing editor at New York Magazine. We look forward to a lively discussion, and then I invite you all to resume the networking and cocktails after the session. Uh, so thank you so much, Philippe, and thank you to all of you for being here. Uh, we'd also specifically like to thank Kathy Wild of the partnership um, for helping to put together such an amazing event. Um, and also to all of our panelists for being here and taking the time. Uh, I understand that Gary just came off a flight from Singapore, so thank you for, for making your way here after that. So uh, I think that we in the media often place the locus of this tech boom that's been going on for you know, the past several years now, the heartbeat of it in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Um, but what's the advantage of being here in New York? Uh, and what are the challenges of being here in New York as a tech company? I'm hoping to direct that question to Chad and to John and to Kevin. Sure, <clears throat> I'll get started. Um, so first of all, uh, I've been in New York for seven years and I, I lived in the Bay Area, worked in Silicon Valley for 10 years. Um, when I went out to Silicon Valley in 1998, uh, I thought it was really amazing because every party I went to out there, everyone there was like an engineer, a product manager, that sort of thing. <laughs> So 10 years later, when I left the Bay Area, I left in part because every party, everyone was an engineer, a product manager, um, or a software developer. So um, 
But really, I think that uh, the really amazing thing about New York is it's a, uh, a city with multiple industries. Um, you know, tech isn't just the dominant industry. But I think what that gives New York is really a life uh, to itself where if you are building a tech company, every day you're interacting with all different types of people. Um, you're in a very international city and we're all building global businesses now. Um, so I think the, the advantages, I have a really hard time thinking of disadvantages to operating in New York. Well, I started uh, Shutterstock back in 2003 and uh, that was a strange time to start a tech company in New York actually. Um, but I just went with it. And actually, I, I, over the years, I've, I've considered whether it would have been better or equal or what the advantages would have been to, to starting out west or, or having more of an office out west. Um, and I've, I've, I've every time been, been happy to be kind of away from the Silicon Valley machine. Um, and what I mean by that is, 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 is this constant kind of reevaluation um, in the private markets um, and, and, and the constant search for capital at that next uh, level. Um, I raised money once uh, and, and the whole rest of the time I was able to just focus on my business. Um, I got a lot of calls from out west um, and, uh, and I, I avoided a lot of them and I think that was, that, that was great. I, just like Chad, have very few, um, uh, I can't think of anything bad about New York. Um, but, but uh, that's, that's one of the, the good things, I feel like. Yeah. And one thing I'd add is just from a historical perspective, since I've been doing startups since last century. Uh, okay, 1996. <laughs> but it still is last century. And so at that point, you know, it's easy to forget that uh, Boston was considered the center of, of startups on the West Coast. And it still is very strong in biotech, but it's not even on the roadmap anymore for online e-commerce media companies. Uh, so it has changed dramatically. Has New York surpassed San Francisco and the Bay Area? No, it hasn't uh, yet. But it's now the unquestioned number two in this country and growing very quickly. And then if you look within tech to certain subsectors, let's look at online media. You know, San Francisco is not even relevant. The top media companies, the online media companies that have 40 or 50 million uniques, the Huffington Post, the Gawkers, uh, the Business Insiders, the Buzzfeeds, every single one is in New York. You know, we own that sector and we will continue to own Big sectors, you know, will have dominant in uh, fashion, uh, commerce, uh, media, things like that. And now you're seeing a second generation of very technical companies that are being developed in New York, still far behind San Francisco in enterprise, but starting to develop. And so it's going to continue to grow. And the only problem we do have, there is one problem, is that our growth has been so significant that there's a shortage of people. I mean, of qualified, experienced product managers, of engineers, of everything. Uh, and so prices go up and that makes it harder. It's like, you know, when the city does well, Fifth Avenue apartments get very expensive. That's a reflection of success, not a reflection of a fundamental problem. Uh, so I think things are going very, very well. Yeah. And do you find that it's hard to attract that a talent to New York or in New York, given that you have other big businesses, banks, law firms that are also looking to hire these sorts of people? Does that make it more difficult to attract them to your companies or to even bring them back from the West Coast? So here's a key, a key comparison. In the late 90s at DoubleClick, I could never and never accomplish in convincing someone to move from the West Coast to join us. And they would say, Kevin, uh, DoubleClick seems great, but if I leave after two years, where am I going to join? You know, I, I can't move my whole family and then be stuck. Today, you know, like at Gilt, we had many, many people come over and they say, look, I'll be there a couple of years. If that doesn't work out, I'll go work at Etsy, I'll go work at Shutterstock, I'll go work at any one of 30 companies and make my career here. And that's fundamentally changed. The second thing that's happened is that New York is just a more attractive city than it was 20 years ago. And so uh, all of us who have kids in college, you know, the entire class uh, wants to come live in New York, maybe in San Francisco, but New York is, is gained in attractiveness. You can actually make a case, I think, for the first time that rent is less expensive in New York than San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> it's really saying something. And so uh, I, I do that regularly. I mean, that's not the only consideration that people have. Um, my, my favorite, you know, we hire a, you know, a fairly young workforce. I think about half of our workforce is under the age of 30. And uh, I had an engineer who was choosing between um, two very prominent West Coast companies and Etsy. And I asked him more, like, what are you into? And he said, I'm really, really into hip hop. The company he was talking to in, on the West Coast is in Cupertino, and I said, how much hip hop do you think you're going to hear in Cupertino? <laughs> um, so I think that whether you're into hip hop or jazz or theater or anything outside of tech, I mean, the advantages in New York are just way beyond um, what you get uh, anywhere else. Yeah. And John? 
Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I just did this this uh, welcome to the freshman class at Columbia. Uh, and when I did my computer science master's there, it was, there, there were 20 people in the class. And today, there are between 250 and to 300 people studying computer science at the master's and, and undergrad level. Uh, so I think over the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot more people that, that are, that are uh, going to be competing well in this world. Okay. Uh, so I want to move on. Uh, Bob and Gary, I'm hoping that you can address this issue. Um, uh, looking at the companies on the stage, looking at the valuations across the whole market, are, are we in a bubble? Easy question to answer, I'm sure. Well, uh, I'll start with the numbers. So yeah. back uh, in what's known as the dot-com bubble, you had technology companies which were sporting multiples two to three times higher than available in the broader S&P. Uh, today, the tech multiple is about 28, uh, and the S&P is around 23, so call it 5%. So you've got a dramatically different uh, outlook there. And I also say that that is excluding uh, a lot of tech companies that weren't making money back in the bubble days. So uh, by a numerical analysis, the answer uh, is no. Uh, now, obviously, there can be pockets within the market, right, uh, that have bubble characteristics to them, and any time you have a essentially zero interest rate environment, you're going to see a bubble pop up somewhere, and somewhere, somehow. Yeah. Gary, do you agree? So, yes, in essence, I, I, I agree with Bob. Um, the, there's a massive difference today than 2000, 2001. 2000, 2001 was an area that if you put .com at the end of your name, you just created a, a, a huge multiple. Today, when you look at the companies that we're talking about that are bubble-ish, they're real companies. We buy their products, we use their products, we pay for their products, and more important, we can't envision our lives without their products, and that's me. Try and take their products away from my kids, and there'd be mutiny. You know, my kids live on their smartphone, they live on their iPhone, they don't understand the way I even live my life and why I would do certain things the way I do. Their favorite question for me, for 90% of the things I do in my life is why? Just why would you do it that way? It seems silly, and, and they're right. So, you know, is there a bubble? I don't know, I, I agree with Bob. I'm not smart enough to say there, there, there's, there is or there isn't a bubble. What I think we're smart enough to know is there's been a fundamental shift in the world in which we live in. The proliferation of smartphones is continuing to grow. As you said, I just got back from Asia, and all they talk about is how many smartphones and how many handsets there's going to be in the world, and the capacity of those smartphones, and how much more they do, and the products that people get used to. So as the population continues to grow, one thing we agree on, the proliferation of smartphones, something else we agree upon, the products that are sold and used on these smartphones, the companies that provide them, are going to become more and more valuable. Just, I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, I was definitely in the last bubble and I enjoyed it enormously. <laughs> and, uh, I recommend I, I, it. I was there too. Yeah. I was in the last decade. Yeah. I was in the last century too. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I'm sorry to report that there is no bubble right now at all. There's zero chance of there being a bubble. And we have to remember what bubble means because it's not the same thing as saying a market is overvalued. So that's just, bubble's a different word. Bubble's when, this is after you, with retrospect, like 80% of the value of an entire sector goes away. It happened to tulips, it happened to internet stocks, it was a bubble. There, you look at the numbers today and there's just no chance of that happening. You know, Double was an example that we were doing a couple hundred million dollars in revenue and our, at the peak we were at 13 billion. And so Double at the time was the same size as, and never made money in, in those years. Um, became very valuable, but was the same size as the companies on the stage that maybe are worth a billion or maybe are worth two billion. Um, that's just an order of magnitude difference, and that's what produces a bubble at the time, uh, and we don't have one right now. Go ahead. Uh, I think the other big thing that's happened in the last three or four years is uh, biotechnology. So we've really seen a tremendous renaissance of that industry, and a lot of it's tied back, uh, back to the mapping of the genome 10, 10 years ago. So now you have literally, you know, a couple hundred biotechnology companies have come public in the last uh, three to four years. And the JOBS Act it was a, I think, key catalyst for that. Uh, but when you say, is that a bubble or not? Because a lot of these companies are, you know, pre-revenue stage. And uh, so we don't know. Uh, but I would say two things. One, give credit to the market because a lot of time the market's uh, criticized for being short term while well, these really have a gestation period of 12 years between drug concept and, and approval. 
And so I did a market opening with uh, Geno uh, Therapeutics, and they have come up with a cancer cure that's based upon using your immune system to help fight the cancer. And they have a video of a young child who would be dead except for this, this drug. The drug is still in trial and can prove not to work. So to the extent you have companies like Juno that prove not to work in time, is that a bubble or not? I would say not. It's just the natural evolution of things, and science is a, uh, a tricky thing. So a lot of things have been driving it is advances in science, and that's not certain. Mm -hmm. And so I want to direct this question. John, did you have any thoughts about this too? Or did I miss you? Yeah. Um, so uh, whether it's a bubble or not, you know, there's a feeling that there maybe have been some big valuations driven in part by this very unusual financing environment that we've been in, and a sense that maybe now that it looks like eventually the Fed is going to raise rates, whether you know it's later this year or next year, uh, that this unusual financing environment might be something like over. Um, so what does that kind of portend for, for these companies that we're talking about that, that sometimes get branded with, with the bubble designation? What do you think, Gary? Well, look, I can make one guarantee in this room. Yeah. The Fed will raise interest rates someday. <laughs> I'll make a second guarantee. They'll lower interest rates someday, too. Sure. But they got to raise them first uh -huh. before they lower. I mean, we all know that. That's just the business cycle. I, I really think that in many respects, with the tech sector, the interest rate part of the equation is not a major driving valuation component. I don't think someone's saying, oh, I get zero return on my secure savings, so therefore I'm going to take it and put it into a tech company in lieu of keep it in the bank. I understand how we get valuation pops in real estate, in utilities, in MLPs. That I understand because they have a dividend, they have a cash flow, you're buying an asset, an income producing asset. But to say that the interest rate component has an effect on the tech sector as a whole, I think that's a tough um, a tough correlation for me to draw. Mm -hmm. the, the, the flip side is, look, there's just enormous amount of cash in the system because the ability to borrow cash is so easy right now. So the broader question is, will the central banks at some point in the future start withdrawing liquidity? And that to me is the bigger question. So does the money supply, not just the dollar supply, the global money supply become scarcer and scarcer over some period of time? And I think Anyone in this room that's ever studied the business cycle or studied monetary policy will say it inevitably, of course it will happen. This is the way the business cycle works. We flood economies with, with money, we extract money as, as economies start growing. So when you start seeing a tighter money supply, you know, will the, 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 the fight for the marginal dollar become tougher? And will the tech companies looking to be financed have to fight harder for that dollar, I think they will have to fight and the barriers will be higher, meaning that you won't throw the mega valuation at the company just because you think they've got a great concept. Mm -hmm. So I want to direct the, oh, sorry, go right ahead. No, I think it, uh, I agree with Gary, and at the pure venture stage, I think the interest rate means zero at that point. And venture firms are not levered, right? They have now more than enough cash they're looking to deploy. So I think the interest rate would be more of an impact on the private equity world. The venture world, I think, would, would move forward independent of any move of the Fed. And so I want to direct this to, to our three panelists that are running companies right now. You know, we've seen this, this kind of nervousness running through the markets this summer. Um, and, and I think that there's been a lot more negativity in the financial press, for instance, uh, a lot more skepticism publicly from investors. Do you feel like we're near some sort of inflection point? Or is tech just keeping on, keeping on doing what it's been doing? There's definitely a difference in the private markets to, uh, in regards to the public. There's, there's a difference between the private markets and the public markets today. Um, we, we look at every private company out there. We have a whole bunch of cash in the bank. And like any public company, we look for to buy things that are creative. Um, and it just feels like there are a lot of companies out there with a few million of revenue. They may be growing fast, which means next year they're going to be six million in revenue. And they have $200 million price tags. And there's dozens of them out there. So it does feel like there's some difference between what's going on in, in the venture and PE world and what's going on in, in the public markets. You can look at the, the, the comparison of, of, of HomeAway versus Airbnb. Um, there, there, there are others also. But it feels like something is off right now. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think private valuations are pretty rich. And I think that there's, I think they're publicly traded internet companies that are more protected than people would think and will grow in value over time. And also, a number of them end up being 
when they start off small, and so they're not that well covered, and people don't understand them that well, and so that disconnect uh, can, can cause problems. I mean, the way we think about it, we think about this with other companies and our own company is, um, you know, the one thing that doesn't change, whether the Fed raises rates or lowers rates or valuations are up or down, is if you're running a business that, you know, generates cash flow and profits and that sort of thing. So um, we really try to run our company uh, with, a, with a long-term focus and build, build it in a way that we can sustain ourselves throughout all the different cycles. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things, just you know, around the numbers, and our VCs mispricing this, you know, I remember, the, what, four years ago when on a panel like this I was asked about was there a bubble because Facebook, as a private company, had just been valued at $10 billion by some crazy Russian guy who turns out to be incredibly brilliant. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and so the, as a VC, if you look at the whole industry, you know, that is up now, whatever, 25 times. And so as an industry, if the other 24 companies went under, that's all we'd read about, and the sector still would have done well. And so they understand that only one or two of those have to work, or work to 5x, for the whole sector to be fine. It's a high risk, high reward uh, industry, and it'll continue that way, and that's what makes it work. Okay. I'll, I'll give you the one quick Mark Andreessen point on this. Take all the capitalization of all the private companies, they don't add up to Apple. That's actually kind of amazing. Yeah. Put and Uber like, in there, I mean, put them all a, in there. A Throw giant all in flock there. of unicorns, right? Right, take like every unicorn, them, take them all, them. add them up, yeah. you get a number less than Apple, market cap. Yeah. So it sort of puts in perspective, and, and that's your point. You know, and, and one of those thousands of companies yeah. you're talking about will probably be as valuable as Apple someday. We don't know which one. And, and 10 of them will at least be one-tenth the size. Yep. But that could be uh, more a comment on how large Apple's market cap is. It's, hard, <laughs> uh, it's hard, hard to fathom there. Um, so this actually leads really well to, to, to a point that I wanted to address to Bob, which is that we've seen a trend of, of companies not seeking, you know, not going public, right? Not raising cash that way, um, or doing so pretty late. Uh, uh, and so what do you think is driving that trend, which I think has been especially exaggerated this year versus last year? I think there's like a dozen of these companies that have gone public versus... Well, as one who runs a public market, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll take the uh, position that I think it's actually a good thing. Uh, yeah. One is to be public, uh, you really want to have a fully baked business model. And I like to say going public is an endless series of quarters, right? So if you're not ready to stand up to the scrutiny of this endless series of quarters, uh, then it will be a, a bumpy road. So going public should represent an act of maturity for a, 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 a company. Uh, and as part of that, we started NASDAQ Private Market, again tied to the Jobs Act, which allows uh, private companies to stay private longer. So one thing, if you want to stay private, you have some real life issues where some employees need liquidity uh, to buy a house, to buy a car. So we wanted to provide a venue for those companies to do that and give them a more, more natural glide path. But I would also make it very clear that private market valuations are different than public market valuations. Private market valuations are by definition determined by a small group, uh, group of people. Typically there's some information asymmetries within that small group and part of that small group can have different motivations uh, with respect to that individual. They could have the portfolio effect which we refer to here. A public market is uh, under regulatory requirement to accept all comers and that's really the magic of price discovery by having people from all walks of life, all different investment horizons come together to, describe, you know, to come up with that price. So that by uh, that level of participation, I think it will more fully reflect the full value of the company. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a private market valuation, but to realize what it is. It's a small number of people, uh, and it's more likely to be subject to uh, debate over time. Mm -hmm. So we have a company that, that recently went public. So uh, to, to uh, borrow a phrase coming from the other end of the panel, yeah, was this, was this an, an act of maturity, a statement of maturity on Etsy's part, going public this year? I think that, that's definitely part of it. I mean, yeah. We're a 10-year-old uh, a company. Etsy yes. started in 2005. And uh, even if you go back to the first bubble, uh, I think on average companies are going public a lot earlier than that. Uh -huh. uh, you know, by the time we went public, uh, you know, this year we reported last year revenue. Um, you know, $196 million. So uh, we were, had a proven business model, uh, very healthy business, and, uh, and you know, 10 years of track record. 
So I want to direct this question to Gary. There was recently this KPMG CEO survey, and it asked CEOs in the Fortune 500 whether they were concerned about the disruption of their business model. And last year, 7% said that they were very concerned, and this year, 30% said that they were very concerned. And like, you know, who knows what's going on there? It's, it's a big swing. So how, how would you explain that, or are you surprised by that? Uh, I, I can't explain it. I mean, I, I, I don't know why only 7% a year ago would have said they were, cons were concerned. I would have said the number would have been higher. I think everyone has to think about technology disturbing some part of their business model or their competitor's business model. I just think it, it, it's a reality. Going back to my, my daughter saying why. Mm -hmm. You know, ev every millennial today says why. Everyone growing up is, is, is approaching the way they live their life in a different fashion. So, you know, some of the most successful companies we're talking about today are not providing a new product. They're just delivering an old product better. And if you don't realize that the world is constantly changing and you're trying to protect your old business model, I think you're doing your shareholders a, disjust, a disservice. And I think you've always got to be questioning your business model, questioning how you can deliver your goods and services and products better to your clients. And if technology is part of the solution, it's part of the solution. You know, we as a company, we're now a third of our people, 9,000 plus people are technologists at Goldman Sachs. We think about technology every day, how we become more and more efficient, how we deliver product, how we deliver knowledge, how we deliver price to our clients more and more efficiently. And I think if we hadn't done that, we would become a bit of an obsolete company. We would not be price effective, we would not be cost effective, and someone else in my industry would have done it to us. And I think that most CEOs I talk to today, almost every CEO I talk to today, thinks about technology. Um, they think about how it's affecting them indirectly and indirectly. And I think that number is going to just continue to grow. Yeah. Well, since we have some CEOs here, is the general answer on the panel yes? Yeah? Yes? No? I was, I was just thinking on behalf of the you know, startup, relatively smaller company CEOs, I want to thank the 70% who are not worried. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> me, me too. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I mean, even, you know, Etsy's, uh, you know, we're just, just now a public company, 10 years old. I mean, we. We're always looking at it at who may disrupt us, and I think it's uh, I think it's mandatory. Okay. Go ahead. No, that's how we make our living is by people underestimating that, and I think it you know it happens. We saw it in music. I mean, uh, one of my own examples, Business Insider started seven years ago, and you know we were when I'd meet people from the Wall Street Journal, they would make fun of us all the time, and now we have double the traffic roughly of the Wall Street Journal, and you know that's with a very small investment and a big big brand on the other side and and growing at 80% a year. And so that it can happen, it can happen not in one year, but it can happen in five or six or seven years where you've lost a position that you had for 50 or 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's happening across the board and I certainly am seeing opportunities. I'm starting companies in healthcare. Uh, I think there are opportunities in financial services. So you know, there's, because there's unlimited capital available, uh, you know, that used to be a constraint for startups. Now you know it's not gonna be a constraint if your model seems to be working. So there'll be more of it and that's what makes it so exciting. It's a great time. So one of the one of the bigger intellectual debates about tech and and this tech boom right now, I think, is about uh, whether it's creating jobs, right? Whether it's creating a lot of part time and contract work for a lot of people. So you know, companies like Uber, companies like Etsy, um, or whether it's destroying them, right? Whether robots are coming for all of our jobs, companies are much smaller than they used to be. You look at actually Apple. Think about its comparative size next to you know an automaker, whoever might have been a big company similarly 50 years ago. Um, and both sides can't be right, right? But I'm interested to hear folks on this panel uh, describe where they fall uh, in that debate. So Chad, what do you think? Sure, I mean, I think um, it's, a, it's really a balance. I mean, there are, in technology, um, you know, some jobs are being um, reduced, but there are others being created. And I think in Etsy's case, uh, you know, we have 1.5 million sellers around the world, about 30% of them consider their creative occupation, uh, which includes selling on Etsy, their full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, for most of the people we speak with, this was uh, an avenue that wasn't available to them before. Um, and so Etsy, the fact that you can literally spend 20 cents to list an item on Etsy and reach a global audience is really a way, if you're a creative person, to reach, um, to reach that audience and then build an entire business. So I think on balance, at least from the Etsy point of view, I think that uh, we've created more opportunity 
uh, rather than less. Mm -hmm. okay, go ahead. Well, I would say the end state is we'll all have the time to be philosophers, right? Because <laughs> the machines will do everything. But I, I would say this. I remember reading an article, and it talked about the uh, census from like 1925, and 80% of those jobs don't exist anymore, right? They don't exist. So it's clearly uh, technology will continue to fundamentally change the world. The jobs that exist today will be different uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. And obviously, it's our job to make sure we have the education system in place and really uh, the workforce ready to go. The world will change. The jobs will be there. They'll be, they'll be in a different form. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. I, I'm, I mean, so on the one hand, yeah, so I graduated from college, what, 30 years ago. And you know, we've had a lot of technology introduced into our lives during that time. It's not like it just started last year. And the unemployment rate today is lower than it was 30 years ago. So in a way, we've somewhat answered that question so far. It, it's not gotten worse. But when I see all the developments that are happening, happening and extrapolate about what's going to happen over the next 10 years, I do get nervous. And I get nervous given our educational system and our country overall. I mean, I don't, when still 30 or percent of our, uh, the kids in New York City don't graduate from high school, I'm not sure there are jobs for them in, in you know, the, the future economy of 10 or 20 years. I, mean, I don't see that very clearly. So I do worry about the disconnect there. So um, that actually leads really well to the next question I wanted to ask, which is, you know, this year Mayor de Blasio offered three pillars for tech growth in New York um, as the city continues to compete with California and other tech hubs um, and comes with some disadvantages, right? New York is very expensive, for instance, to live in. That's got to be one. Um, and so his three pillars were professional development, like money for um, state colleges, improving broadband access, and using technology itself to make the city more affordable. Um, so are those the right pillars, or are there other ones that you would add as you're looking to bring companies and workers to New York to help your businesses? This is for the whole panel, if anybody wants to jump in. Excuse me. I'll jump in. Professional okay. development. I mean, I think professional development's really important. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned in my life, I was, I was actually an English major in college, like with a focus on Shakespeare, and I taught myself how to code after I graduated from college. And the reason I learned to code is because um, I randomly fell into it. What I realized was that coding and software was really a creative profession. And it wasn't just math and science, I think, as, it's, as it even is being positioned today. So on the professional development point, I, I really agree that that's a pillar. But I think that we have to make um, computer science and programming and software development, um, we have to present it more as a uh, not just math and science, but also creative, and uh, really make it part of a liberal arts approach to education where learning other languages um, includes not just Spanish and Mandarin, but you know, PHP and Java. Yeah, I, I would say that, first of all, the, the, there aren't that many things that the mayor specifically can do that just jumpstart tech growth. Uh, the biggest constraint for all of us still is both the price and availability of technical talent. And that's just New York City, that's the whole country, it's eventually the whole world. The whole world, yeah. The, um, there are only so many ways to, to impact that. So either more people are going to uh, learn computer science, um, or more people who know computer science outside of the world are going to come here, which is immigration. And so Congress, I'm sure, is on that, and will do a good job. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. And quickly. Yeah, and quickly. Yeah. So uh, that's the obvious, obvious solution. That's the number one thing I would like, which unfortunately the mayor doesn't impact. And the third, which is happening in a greater degree than people realize, is that you know, the companies in this room uh, employ more and more people abroad because they have to find those engineers, and they're just not here. Fewer people graduated with a degree in computer science two years ago than 10 years ago in the United States. That's crazy. We have a problem. But uh, so I think the mayor is trying to do what he can. The announcement last week on more computer science training in the high schools is a good step. So feel, feel good about that uh, and would like to have uh, immigration. And, but the final thing is just making New York an attractive place to live uh, you know, helps New York as much as anything. You know, I still lost people 20 years ago because they'd say, ah, grew up in Kansas. If there's so much crime in New York, I don't want to come. The fact that that has more or less gone away is very helpful. If housing was a little bit more affordable, that would be the one thing that would help as well. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I, if I, I think Kevin just sort of hit the nail on the head. So as you said, I came back from Singapore. I was at the Singapore Summit this weekend. The whole weekend was on technology and making Singapore the technology capital of Asia. We debated this topic at nausea. 
The Singaporean government's willing to spend tax monies, tax relief. They're willing to give anything to any company to come out to Singapore and make it their technology headquarters of the world. New York starts with a huge advantage, but Kevin's right. It's about livability. You know, the city just has to be really livable, and the young kids that want to come here have to want to live here. Um, yeah, it's going to be expensive. It, it, if he can figure out a way to make it cheaper, God bless him, let him figure out a way to make it cheaper. I mean, everyone on the panel wants their young kids coming out of school, their programmers, their engineers to live cheaper. It would be great. Um, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the attractiveness of the city. And it's, it's the little simple things about safety, security, and, and, and I think fight the basic wars. And, and New York's got such a competitive advantage that it will, will do the rest by itself. I'd add one other area. Public transportation is another way of driving that. You know, there are places in New York that are maybe 10 miles from this building, but you don't want to live there because you know it would take you an hour to get here or an hour and a half just because it's so convoluted. That should be a problem that can be solved. We have a complicated political situation with the MTA and the state and the city, and it hasn't been solved, but I don't think we've done very many interesting things in public transportation in the last you know, 10 years. Very little has been built. Uh, and so the city is working on that, and they have some ideas, but more needs that. Yeah. And so um, scoping back out, we're in campaign season. And if you uh, watched the three-hour Republican debate, if you were so unlucky to sit through all of that, uh, there was basically no discussion of the economy. It was extremely de minimis. There were a couple minutes in that whole thing. And I think that probably some of that is because uh, the economy has been so quiet. Growth has just been chugging along. Maybe it's not front and center anymore. But nevertheless, you started to see a trickle of proposals coming from right and left. So they're actually, you know, some of them fairly radical. So um, what are you making of the candidates? And, and what are the issues that you wish that they were talking about, uh, perhaps similar to the ones that you'd like to see in the city? And again, that's for the whole panel, if anybody wants to chime in. Well, I, I think immigration has to be at the top of the list. I thought we were going to get closer in the last couple of years, but it ties back to what we're talking about here. It ties back to Austin, to the Valley. There's just not enough engineering talent. And the remarkable thing is the engineering talent today wants to come into the U.S. Some, of it, A lot of it is educated in the U.S. and can't stay here. Uh, so if you really want the engine of economic growth, and it's going to be centered around technology, you have to bring the fuel in. You've got to let the fuel stay here. You've got to let the engineers stay in this country. And immigration has been, uh, this form, H-1B immigration, has been wrapped up in illegal immigration. To me, they should be divisible issues and solve the easy one uh, first and work on the harder one second. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. ahead. It, 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 Singapore would strategically offer, you know, if we, imagine what the United States would do if we said to uh, any country, you know, anyone from your country that has a master's in computer science is guaranteed a, uh, a green card if they come here. Uh, you know, we would have a flood of unbelievably talented people coming here, and they would do great things. Uh, and, but we don't, we, we do the opposite right now. You know, people are begging to come here, and they can't get in. So that was disappointing. I mean, I, look, the whole, the whole presidential race so far is relatively uh, depressing. I'm probably not the only one that thinks that. Um, I, I don't think I could have watched that whole debate, but I did read a good summary of it. And apparently Planned Parenthood is the only issue that matters in the world right now. <laughs> So the, the other, did you have? Okay. So, the, you know, the other topics I would say, you know, immigration, agree with. Um, reg reform. Look, we developed technology in this country that we then tried to regulate out of usefulness. You know, look at Uber in New York City. Look at what was going on with Airbnb. You, you, you know, if, if we want to become the technology innovator of the world, but we don't want to allow our technology to be used in our country. Kind of interesting. Um, the whole corporate tax reform. You know, we're, we're, again, we're in a global world. We're trying to compete with the rest of the world. The rest of the world knows there's a technology race going on out there. Um, again, where do, you, where do you want to start your company? And, and it's right. We, we are all offsourcing talent, outsourcing talent to other parts of the world, other tax jurisdictions, other labor jurisdictions. So you know, the, the, the more you can level the playing field if you're a presidential candidate and had some economic plan towards that, I think that's all very helpful. I'd add to it, I mean, just the uh, infrastructure. So I think, you know, an investment, it seems clear to me that a significant uh, investment in infrastructure would, would pay off, you know, bridges, roads, things like that, uh, employing lots of people, probably pay off uh, for us. 
Um, so I throw that in as well. And I would say that was the deal we thought was going to happen in Congress this year. Yeah. Uh, so you have a situation now where you can't repatriate your money without paying a penalty. So we have a significant operation in Sweden, not known as a low tax haven. We pay the Swedish tax, and then the money we bring back has to get taxed again. So we do what you would think, we leave it uh, overseas. And it gives us an incentive to invest overseas, to buy companies overseas. If we could bring the money back, uh, you know, in a tax-free or minimal tax basis, that would be good. And the deal that was being worked was you'd have a repatriation, uh, not holiday, you'd still pay tax, but that would then also be used to fund an infrastructure bank. Uh, I think it was a tremendous deal. Right. thought it had a great chance of passing, and uh, Kathy must have tried to make it happen, but we didn't quite get there. So we need things, you know, common sense movements like that from Congress to happen. And it seems to me that corporate America has been asking for these things for some time now and has put a significant shoulder and a lot of money behind trying to make them happen on immigration reform, on corporate tax reform. There's been a lot of discussion. None of this is unknown to any politician. Uh, but that hasn't really broken through. And, and uh, why do you think that is? And do you think that, that might change now that campaign season is? I, I agree with most of your points except for corporate tax reform. So I do think we want corporate tax reform. The corporate sector has not actually been able to put together one comprehensive plan. And the challenge there is that if there were 10 sectors here and there's some tax breaks here and tax breaks here and tax breaks here, most people want to cut everyone else's tax breaks and not their own. And it's hard to make it net neutral at the end. So in theory, what everyone wants is fewer tax breaks overall and a lower marginal tax rate. And most economists would probably recommend that. And it's hard to get there. And, and one of the hidden secrets is a lot of the tax breaks in the corporate world goes to manufacturers. Uh, and they were not in a mood to reduce the tax or increase the tax burden on American based manufacturing, certainly to help the financial services industry or other industries. So that was certainly a sticking point. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the point stands. You know, there, uh, there have been many, many pushes, right? If you, if you think of immigration as one thing that the corporate world is certainly united on, yes. on, on wanting immigration reform and a decoupling of H1B and, you know, uh, uh, that from the broader issue. Um, you know, do you think that Washington is listening to you? Have you gotten the sense that there's much to be hopeful about? Def define Washington to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, no. that answers your question. I mean, there's, yeah. there's not one Washington. Mm -hmm. there's, there's macro or micro pockets of Washington right now, and there's no middle ground. The problem is the country is bifurcated. You know, we go farther to the right and farther to the left, and no one left in the middle. And so uh, what do you guys think about uh, the prospect of a President Trump, a Republican front runner here? Also, a corporate executive. A terrific one, is my understanding. But, but you know, when you, he's very, he's very rich. I, 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 think, uh, I, I think the Trump phenomena is tied to what we're talking about here. So you have Congress at an approval rating of 19% or below 19%. So in some way, that sentiment was going to be reflected, right? And so when you have somebody come forward, forget the personality, but somebody comes forward and says, I can make things happen, I can make a deal happen, people are going to be inclined to listen to it because we've been gone you know, a long time without anything really productive happening out of Congress. So to me, it's not surprising that you see Dr. Carson, Carly, uh, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, people coming from outside the system. It's a direct reflection of that 19% number. Well, I think that uh, we're going to end on that note, but I want to thank all of you so much for being here and uh, for engaging in this discussion, and thank you to everybody else. Thanks. Drinks over there. <laughs>